Well, good morning again, everyone. Um, was it weird to not sing? Yeah, you guys did a good job. Didn't hear any voices. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's great to be back here. This is an unusual time, and I think a lot of there's been a lot of firsts in this time of lockdown. Like I've never done that before. Um, I'm going to tell you one of mine, which is kind of embarrassing, but it's also something that I'm finding a lot of joy in. So I'm just going to let you into this secret of mine. Um, I have started a pets Instagram, like one that's just about my pets. And like, if you're not familiar with Instagram, let me, let me give you some context for this. Um, so to everyone who's my mum's age, Instagram is like Facebook, but it's not got Candy Crush on it. And you don't have like friends anniversaries. Um, to, to all you TikTokers in the room, I know who you are. Um, Instagram, it doesn't have dance routines that you learn and you mimic, much to my disappointment. Uh, Laura Campbell told me very boldly this week, Ruth, you're too old for TikTok. I was gutted, but she's probably right. Anyway, so Instagram, it's kind of something in the middle of TikTok and Facebook, and you just share a bunch of pictures, and it's great. <laughs> and uh, I, th I think with, with pet Instagram, it's different to just your normal, pet, uh, normal Instagram, because um, I think there's basically there's two age groups of people who have pet Instagrams. There's people like me, who are in their 30s and think they're 22, but they're not. And then there's like every 11 year old girl with her first smartphone who has created an account for her pet. Um, th th this is a picture from my Instagram and this is actually my guinea pig whose name is Kelvin, named after this Kelvin. My, my kids came up with the name, but I love it. So this is, this is Kelvin the guinea pig on my pet's Instagram. Um, and what's fun about uh, things like Instagram is like, it, it's social, it's not just the pictures, like you meet other people with similar interests. And I've been loving seeing this window into, into the souls of many people that I didn't know previously and who I don't usually hang out with. And it's fun, but it, you know, it's also kind of sad because you, you see like some great things in other people's lives and then you see some things that are quite sad and remind you like, do you know what, there's a lot of people out there who feel really lost. And you see people who are about my age, uh, who use social media and use Instagram, uh, they tend to like put on a mask and a filter on their Instagram and they only present the best parts of their life uh, unless they are trying to make a point about raising awareness for mental health and then they might be a bit more vulnerable. But the thing is that with the 11 year old girls on their first smartphones, they don't hide anything. They put all the chat out there, you see all the friendship drama and the insecurities and everything they feel, they just put it out there and I've been reading it. So I want to tell you about one of my followers, someone who is following me, who I am also following and I'm learning a lot about her life. Um, she'll remain unnamed, but she's 13 years old and in many ways I think she's great. But this is her feed, I'll show you what her feed looks like. Um, she just got Instagram on the 15th of July. She's new. She's just joined the Instagram world. And when she started out, um, she was a pet's Instagram, just like me. Uh, and so I think that's what brought us together. We, we bonded over that common interest. And you can see here that the, the first few pictures are actually just pictures of her guinea pigs, and they're very cute. But then I noticed that she started posting these stories where she'd got like a, a make your own lip gloss kit where you get like different flavors of the lip gloss and you get glitter and all these different colors and, and she started making her own lip gloss and I was like, that's great. And then she started posting, would anyone like to buy one of my lip glosses for $10? I thought, wow, that's really bold, that's great. She's, she's making a business. And before I knew it, she had a whole new identity and she rebranded her account from being a pet's Instagram to advertising it as being cheap promo for vegan, cruelty-free lip gloss. And then before I know it, she's asking for brand ambassadors. She wants people to represent her lip gloss line and to represent her brand of lip gloss. Uh, what's more? Here's how you become a brand ambassador. If you have a thousand followers, she will give you one of her lip glosses for free. And if you want to be a brand ambassador, but you don't yet have a thousand followers, you can get a 75% off discount and still get one and be someone who represents her line. Listen to this, she posted this. My dream is to become an influencer. 
And so I'm giving away lip gloss so I can achieve this dream. Please direct message me, it will really help me. And if you're below 1,000, you get 75% off my lip gloss. This girl, she got her Instagram account on the 15th of July. She started her journey as a guinea pig's Instagram. And then uh, within days, she changes her whole identity to being a cosmetics line. She wants to be an influencer, but she doesn't even know what she wants to really influence people in. An influencer doesn't even really know what they own, what, what it is that they're inspiring people to do. Like, is it just me or does she sound a bit lost? And what I find sad is that though I think most of us wouldn't reveal our identity crisis in such a public way, I don't think it's just 13 year old girls who are feeling this level of confidence about the meaning of their life. I'm sure many of us can relate to insecurities uh, surrounding just wanting to be someone that has something that's worth following, wanting to be someone that people look up to and are inspired by. So my question for you today at church is, do you know that you do actually have something that's influential? Have you found the meaning of your life and that that is actually something worth shouting about? See, the thing is that whether you want to be or not, you are an influencer. We all have a circle of people in our lives who see us, who know us, and you are influencing them, whether it is intentional or unintentional, whether it is for good or for bad. And yes, uh, I'd say we all have different reaches of influence. Some people have a lot of people who are looking, looking at them and, and learning from them. Some people, it's maybe a smaller group. But whether you like it or not, you are an influencer. So I want a truth type for the people at home. And you can say this out loud in here just so that we're all clear. I want you to truth type or say, I am an influencer. Let me hear it. Some of you are dying with cringe. That is so cringy. But whether you like it or not, you just are. You just are. And the Bible tells us that we actually do have something incredible. We know someone incredible. And he says that when you come to him, we will never thirst again. He says that he brings life and life in abundance. And he says that through him, we can know our Father in heaven and have eternal life. And people who've been Christians for a long time sometimes get so used to church routine that we forget how wonderful Jesus actually is. And not only do we need to keep remembering how great he is, but then we need to be able to shout about that to other people who need him. And what the, the mind-blowing thing is that we don't become influencers by self-promotion, by the shares and the likes and please follow me and make my dream come true. We become influencers actually by self-denial and running to the one who gives us life. See, there's this thing in the kingdom of God, it seems in many ways like it's backwards. You have to be humble to be exalted. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Uh, the way of cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it also really is the key to life and life in abundance. So I want you to get your Bible out and a pen or pencil so that you can mark this up because we're just going to stay in this one little passage for the, this whole time. So turn in your Bible or on your device to Matthew 16, 24 to 27. While you're turning there, I'll read it out. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds." There are some false ideas out there about our relationship with Jesus or with the Father. 
that portray him as being cruel and controlling. But I challenge you, if you read the Bible for yourself and don't just read it in little chunks, if you read the whole thing and get the context of the bigger picture and see what God is like with people consistently throughout time in many different situations, you will find he is not cruel and not controlling. He is kind, he is loving, he is gracious. And when I've been praying about this, this message and thinking about this concept, uh, I felt like God gave me a picture to illustrate this point. You see, God speaks to us through many things, like yes, through the Bible, but also uh, through the things we see, through his creation that he has made, through songs, through people around us. He, he uses many things to reveal himself to us. And one of the reasons that I'm one of those people that has a pet Instagram is just that I love animals. Like, God created these things, and I think that when we observe God's creation, we can learn a lot about who he is and what he wants us to know. So the picture that I have in my mind when I think about this is it's of a sheepdog and his master. I found this on Google. This isn't literally what God like downloaded on my computer. Um, but this is the image that came to mind. A sheepdog follows his master, but the master cares deeply for the sheepdog. And I love this relationship because it's, it's a two-way thing. The sheepdog has humbled himself. He is obedient. He knows the master's voice. He follows his commands. And he works very, very hard and, and contributes to the life and the running of the farm. He, he does a job that the master wouldn't do on his own. But the master, he's not cruel. He loves this dog. Like, he's a strong leader, but... He also has this great affection for the dog. And this animal, unlike any of the other animals on the farm, this animal gets to live in his house. He gets to sleep at his feet. He gets to enjoy the warmth of the fire. He probably eats scraps from his dinner table. And while the dog works for the master, yes, the master considers the dog to be his best friend. So I'm going to use this image throughout. My heart today is not to tell you to be obedient. Um, I'm not just going to tell you, you have to deny yourself and be obedient. I want to inspire you to get to know your master, to learn to hear what he says and to have the courage and the faith to step out and follow in his direction. And in that, I believe you will end up living the most fulfilling life possible. You will find yourself. So my first point, again from this passage, if, if anyone wishes to come after me, it's got to start with who is Jesus and do I want to go after him? Some people start with what ought I to be like as a Christian or what is expected of me from people at church. But we need to start with the most important thing. It is about loving God. Like, can you love someone you don't know? No. So it's got to start with getting to know him so that you can learn to love him. I want you to truth type or speak out loud. The most important thing is knowing Jesus. Let me hear it. The most important thing is knowing Jesus. Don't just be obedient for the sake of obedience. Know him. That is the most important thing. And my heart is that we wouldn't be religious. We wouldn't be just people who are doing the things that, that Jesus is about and doing the tasks of Jesus without actually having a relationship with him as our Lord. Because he is actually real. We didn't believe that. We wouldn't be here. He is actually real. He does actually speak to you and he does really love you. The key to finding your life, uh, to not being lost, is first getting to know Jesus and then making him your master. That is step one. And if you make anything else your, your main goal in life, then you will not be satisfied. Like your career path ultimately will not satisfy you. Getting married and having kids will not ultimately satisfy you. There is only one who can truly quench every thirst and that is Jesus. So what does that look like? How do you get to know him? 
That's, it's the same as getting to know any, any person in a human relationship. You have to spend time with him. You have to be around him a bunch. Uh, don't make projects of church events and think, oh, if I do all these things, I'll join a Bible read through group and I'll show up to help at a church service. And, you know, when you make projects of lots of church things, it might not actually be bringing you any closer to being in a personal relationship with Jesus. But if you use the kinds of things that we do as church, at church as like vehicles to, to run near to Jesus through, then that is what is going to build your relationship with him. So I want to say join a Bible read-through group, not to check a box and say, like, this is just a good thing to do to get into community, uh, but really see your Bible read-through as, like, your opportunity to spend time with God. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I don't get around to reading the Bible on my own. I'm just, like, not that disciplined a person. But when I know that Thursday night is coming up and that I'm going to meet my group, and they're going to want to hear what I've read, like, that gives me the motivation to be like, oh, actually, yeah, I am going to get into the Word this week, and I'm going to spend some time on it. And I'm sure many of you who are in Bible read-through groups will know, sometimes Bible read-through is a high, and sometimes you are just getting it done to get it done in time for your group. But I want to encourage you today to try as best as you can to view Bible reading not as a thing that ought to be done, but as an opportunity to get to know God to see what is he like, what does he say he's like, how does he relate to people, how does he respond to people uh, when they mess up, how does he respond to people in various circumstances. Like reading the Bible cover to cover and getting the bigger picture, seeing the whole story is going to help you then spot God in your own life. So view Bible read through as an opportunity to meet with God, view the the model of Bible read through the group as like accountability and like a a bunch of people who are also trying to get to know Jesus and you can learn together and you can grow together. So get to know Jesus, spend time with him, read the Bible, same with prayer. Don't do prayer just because that's a thing that we ought to do or because, oh, that's a really strong force that does work. I mean, I would say that prayer does work, but that's not the heart behind why we do it. Like prayer at its most simplest form is It's relationship with God. It's talking to him. It's expressing to him the things that are on our heart that that we want his help with. Or sometimes prayer is silent and it's just listening to him and waiting on him. Got to be about relationship with him. And the more time you spend with Jesus, the more you learn about him, the more you learn to trust him. You can't trust someone you don't know. And then you really can make him your master and say, I'm going to follow you. Jesus says that in him, we will never be thirsty again. So if you are still thirsty, I wonder if there is more of your relationship with Jesus that you could be tapping into. So don't give up. Keep going. Keep running to him. Some things that you can do to to get to know Jesus. Um, I just mentioned Bible read-through. You can still join a group if you want to. Um, Alpha, the Alpha course is just finishing up. There's only a few weeks left, but the Alpha course is a great course to learn about uh, who God is and and some, uh, yeah, stuff about Christianity. I'm sure it'll roll around again. I would highly recommend it. Also, the prayer team are planning on running the prayer course in autumn, right? Yeah? Um, We've not got all the details on that yet, but it's similar to Alpha in that there's a video that you watch and there's um, discussion to be had and there's practical. Oh, I'll let Angela be the captain of that. She can tell you what it's going to look like. Um, But when that rolls around, that is going to be an opportunity to learn about your relationship with God as well. So I would highly recommend it. Okay, my second point from this passage. He must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Part of following Jesus is surrendering your right to be the leader of your own life. Making someone your master is humbling. It means laying down your own preferences to be obedient. But what I believe is important here is to look at our motivation for denying ourselves. If we think that being obedient is just because we have to, then we make Jesus like an evil dictator. If we serve Jesus for the fear of what would happen if we don't, then we make him like a cruel villain. And I can tell you that is not who he is. That's not what it's like with him. He says, I am the good shepherd. So I want you to truth type or say in the room, Jesus is the good shepherd. I'm going to hear it. Jesus is the good shepherd. Okay, and I want good in capitals if you can do that, if you're not too late. (laughs) 
That is the truth. Again, as you read about him, as you get to know him, you will see he is good. And so the kind of service he calls us to has got to be motivated by love. I love how in the New Testament, Paul says in many of his letters, he says, I, Paul, a slave to Christ, or in some translations, a bond slave to Christ, or a bond servant to the Messiah. And I want to talk about this because we've got a lot of baggage with the concept of slavery. So firstly, I will say slavery as we know it is not okay. And I know people might have tried to use the Bible to justify slavery, uh, but I would say that people who have done that do not know the nature and the character of God. Like, he is loving. He gives freedom. He hates injustice. He listens to the voice of the oppressed, and he has vengeance on evil. God is not okay with slavery. As a side note, and I know people who've been hanging out with me have heard me talk about this before, but I also think that God is deeply grieved by Scotland's history with slavery, by the fact that our our nation prospered on the injustice of slaving many human lives. And I feel like as a nation, uh, we've got some loose ends to tie up think that, you know, the slave trade may have officially ended, but I still think we need to make some sort of monument to remember the lives that are lost. I think we need to talk about it in education and learn from the dark parts of our history. Like, I think this is a a part of our history that is not okay, and and we need to own that. If you've also got a heart for that and and, and are praying about it, like, chat to me, because this is something I'm thinking about a lot. But that's a side topic. My, My point there is slavery is not good. It is not in line with God's heart. So what is it to be a slave to Christ. Exodus 21. I'll read it to you if you're not turning there yourself because it's far away from Matthew. So um, 21 verse 2 says, when you buy a Hebrew slave, he is to serve for six years. Then in the seventh year, he is to leave as a free man without paying anything. So point to notice there, hired slaves in the Old Testament were not captured and enslaved for life. They, uh, they fulfilled that job within six years and then had an option to completely walk away. But verse five, but if the slave says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I do not want to leave as a free man. His master is to bring him to the judges and then bring him to the door or doorpost. His master must pierce his ear with an awl and he will serve his master for life. And and they had their their ears pierced as a mark that um, this is someone who has not been unwillingly enslaved but this, this, the bond slave is someone who loves his master, who was granted freedom and yet who from his place of freedom willingly chose to serve him and not just for another seven years not just for the next job but for the rest of his life so when Paul says I Paul a slave of Christ Jesus it doesn't mean I've been captured and I'm being held against my will he's saying I love my master and I want to serve him for my life so if you're a Christian and you find your time being consumed by serving at church or or other things for God, then I've got a question for you. Do you feel enslaved to the ways of Christ? Or have you willingly chosen to serve him out of love? I'm going to say that again because I think it's important. Do you feel enslaved to the ways of Christ Or have you willingly chosen to serve him out of love? And I think many Christians are running on empty because they feel enslaved to the Christian lifestyle or or, or the the church routine. And I can assure you that if if that's your heart motivation, you're going to dry up. But I hope that this time of lockdown, even for us here at Rehope Southside as a church family, has been a good opportunity to almost like have a rest and have a reset and really think and ask our hearts, like, why do I do the things I do? Or how, or, uh, how often um, am I serving and doing the things I'm doing? And is that healthy? And I know that as we open up church and as we start calling for help and saying, oh, we need help on the sound team and we need help in the kids team and things like that, like, I hope that... We, are, we can invite you back, um, not to serve because there's a need, uh, but an opportunity for you to serve Jesus, either in obedience to him because he has put it on your heart and he is asking you to do that, 
or just simply because you love him and you're like, I want to help with the things that are about him. Like that is the heart motive that we want in service, to love first and then serve. Love Jesus, love people, love the church, and then help. Don't just help because there's a need. When we have a community serving together out of love for God, then we endure all things. And we make it through the hard times together without turning bitter. So another bit of truth, I want you to truth type or say, love endures all things. Can I hear it? Love endures all things. And and type that, you can put it in capitals as well if you want. It is love that endures all things, not obedience endures all things or um, good hard work endures all things. Maybe they do sometimes, but really it is love that endures all things. And I'll let you into a secret. It's not a secret, actually. I say this all the time. Uh, I never aspired to be the pastor of a church. <laughs> like, I never thought, one day when I grow up, I want to be a church leader. <laughs> Like, that was never my dream in life. That was never my career trajectory or or what I was aiming for. Um, When I was a child, I wanted to be an artist. Uh, When I left school, I took a couple of gap years, and if I'd had my choice then, I would have lived gap year life for the rest of my life. Like, that's what I wanted to do. I would still love to be in a gap year. But the thing is that I met Jesus, and he called me back to Scotland for my gap years, and then he called me to serve and to help with church. And then 10 years later, he called me to lead a church. And so I took this job, I'm in this position, uh, not because this has been my ambition, but because I know the voice of my master and he has been speaking to me over these years and he has nudged me and he has led me. And because I love him and I trust him, then of course I'm here. And do you know what? It's, It's not always an easy job, but... I'm also finding a lot of joy in it. There is a lot of really great things, challenges and all, about what I'm doing right now. So my prayer and my hope for you is that no matter what you do with your life, that the way you make your decisions is surrendered to Jesus. Like, we're not all called to be in full-time ministry. We're, we, we're different people with different gifts and different life experiences. But what is important is that as we make these decisions, we are listening to our master, we are trusting him, we are following. And when he tells you to go, you go. When he tells you to stay, you stay, and you persevere, and you keep loving. And when you're not clear on the next step, you still invest in your relationship with him and be about the things that he loves according to who he's made you to be. That's my hope for you. So my third point from this passage but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So let's talk about people who feel lost again. My 13-year-old guinea pig influencer turned cosmetic line business owner friend, she has a birthday this week. Uh, 7th of August, it's it's gonna be her birthday this week and she posted this, just this week. She says, I'm turning 14 on August 7th. I have a strong passion for modeling and showing my talent to the world. Right now, I only have about 100 followers. I really wanted to reach 10,000 for my birthday. I want to move out when I'm 16 to pursue my passion. Uh, A follow, a shout out, a comment, a repost, a share would be amazing. Please help me accomplish my dreams. And I'm sure many of us here can relate to the insecurities of unmet expectations every time a birthday rolls around. Jesus says, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So maybe it's time for a perspective shift. Rather than storing up your personal goals for for your next birthday, maybe seek Jesus for what are his goals by your next birthday. Back to our sheepdog here. Right, the sheepdog has surrendered his life to the master's command. The sheepdog works hard. Uh, have you ever watched a sheepdog herding sheep? I got to see sheepdog trials on North US a couple of years ago, and it was amazing. Like those dogs have so much energy and so much skill. It's it's so good. But that those dogs, they are doing what they were created to do. They are made for it. They are good at it. 
And I think that, that though their work is hard work and it's, it's submissive, I think these dogs have the best quality of life that they could possibly have. Not only are they serving a purpose, but they are loving life. And there's a cost to following Jesus. Sometimes it's hard work. Sometimes it means uh, surrendering your own rights and following him. But do you know what? I think it is the path to true thriving. And I want to mention entitlement because entitlement robs the joy of Jesus' plan for our lives. He says, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. So are there things that you're feeling entitled to that you are trying to save, but that need to be surrendered to your master? Entitlement isn't compatible with having a master in your life because entitlement says, I am owed this. Whereas submission to the master says, master, I would love this, but I still love you whether or not this happens. And I think we all know people who have given up on Jesus at some point when he didn't provide the things that they were hoping for. But I think those people, they, they walked away from Jesus, not when the things didn't get provided for, but at whatever point their attitude changed from, I will follow you because I love you, to this relationship is conditional on if you answer my prayers. Like that is the attitude shift. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And surrendering to Jesus out of love is how we are truly going to find our life. So hang in there and trust him. This relationship takes trust, but it leads to pure joy. Like how happy do these dogs look? Who doesn't want to look like that? My final point as we wrap up. Jesus says, for the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Revelation talks about this as well. Uh, it says that everyone's going to be judged according to their works. And Jesus tells us not to store up treasures on earth, but in heaven. But wait a second, I thought we were saved by grace. Like, like, haven't we just been saying, no matter what you have done or what you do, God still loves you. Nothing can separate you from his love. And that is true. But it doesn't mean that our works and our choices don't mean anything. Basically, our salvation is assured unconditionally. We, God welcomes us back. God gives us a place in eternity with him, regardless of what we have done just by grace, just by what Jesus has done for us. That is true. But also... <laughs> The Bible says we will be repaid for our deeds. And I think of this as like positive incentives to keep going. We need that. So I want you at home to truth type, I will be repaid for my deeds. And you can say it here, I will be repaid for my deeds. And that's not our sole heart motive. Our heart motive is to love and to serve. But it is helpful to know that for every time there is a cost in following Jesus and you have to give something up or you have to lay something down or you have to persevere, Jesus is saying you're going to get repaid for this in the future. Be encouraged. Do not give up. Keep following. Keep going. Keep trusting. Yes, our cross to bear is heavy, but it is in these trials that he is making us perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. So my challenge to you today is simply, let's see what the challenge says because I've apparently not written it in my notes. Get to know Jesus and make him your master. Start with getting to know him. Learn to love him. And then say, yes, I'm going to follow you. A couple practical things you can do. Uh, commit to your Bible read-through group. Like, actually, spend your time in your Bible thinking, I'm drawing near to God. I'm learning about him. Do the prayer course when that comes up. Learn to hear God's voice. A book I like is called Can You Hear Me by Brad Jersak on listening to God. I really like that book. Get to know your master. And then you are going to find your life. So... We're going to have a time now to, to respond to God in a number of ways. Um, why don't you stand with me?